This week in IT, a new report says that UK government workers saved only 26 minutes a day using Copilot. AI could mean that you get a pay rise while others lose their jobs. And some organisations are looking to repatriate certain cloud workloads. So stay tuned for all the latest. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Microsoft 365, Azure and Windows. But before I get started, I've got a quick favour to ask you. About 60% of the people who watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. As we go live today, we're on about 12,560 subscribers. I'd love it if we could push that up to 12,650 this week. So if you'd like to see these weekly news roundups from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Microsoft has been talking about AI and Copilot a lot over the last two years and this year's build conference was no different. It was AI, AI, all the way. A recent survey by the UK's Government Digital Service Department found that giving civil service employees access to Microsoft 365 Copilot saved them an average of 26 minutes per day on office tasks. So around 70% of the users that were surveyed agreed that Copilot helped to reduce the amount of mundane work that they have to do every day. And the functionality that you have there today is mainly, I suppose, generative in the sense that it can help to help you write an email, for instance, or to tidy up the language in a Word document, or to provide summaries and overviews. These are the things that at least I find Copilot is most useful for. If you took that average and added it up for the entire year, it would save each employee about 13 days. Now, considering the price of Copilot, I think it's about 30 US dollars per user a month. So that's a pretty steep price to add on for each user, considering you're only really saving 13 days of time a year. Now, you might decide that 13 days a year is actually quite a substantial saving to make. Maybe it's worth paying that fee. I think that many organizations will consider it to be too much, even if you get those kind of savings out of it. Of course, it really depends on the user, what kind of tasks they're performing, and whether that makes a significant reason for you to invest in terms of a return on investment for the license that you're going to have to pay for Copilot. And some have considered that Copilot in Microsoft 365 is a failure. I think it's too early to say that it's a failure. A lot of this stuff that Microsoft is talking about at Build and on their website hasn't even made it into Copilot yet. A lot of the things that they were talking about last year, like the ability to triage email, at least I don't see that in any of the Microsoft 365 tenants that I work in and where I have a Copilot license at this stage. So I'm guessing that a lot of these features are still haven't made it into the stable channel. There's a whole load of stuff that Microsoft talked about at Build that is going to make Copilot a lot more useful. So I think it's a little bit early to say this is really a technology that's in its infancy. I think it's a little bit overpriced for the things that it can do and the potential time saving that you get on it today. But as we go forwards, I think that return on investment equation is potentially going to change. One of the problems that I have with Copilot is that the answers it brings back are just too generic in most cases, usually quite short as well, trying to get it to produce something that's a bit longer, a little bit less generic. Sometimes it's possible to do if you try to persuade it with the right prompts and things, but it's a little bit of a pain. And what I think is that until Microsoft get Copilot tuning out into the world, Copilot is going to have limited usability for that average end user. Now, of course, there are lots of things that you can potentially do in the background with agents and connecting things together. I think that not enough organizations are using those things at the moment, maybe because they don't have access to them, maybe because nobody really understands how to use them and make all of that stuff work. So there's just not enough evidence that those things can really make a difference. All the things that Microsoft are talking about on paper 
potentially can make a big difference. All the stuff connected to agents, if we can really get the orchestration of them working together. And again, that's a new feature that isn't out there for you know, anybody beyond, I think, a private preview at this stage. If they can get all of those things working, if they can deliver on the promises that they've made, and that's a big if, we all know with Microsoft that they don't always manage to deliver the promises that they make, then this, of course, could potentially revolutionize the way we work. And the next story is a little bit about that. But I think that once you're able to tune a large language model and essentially get it to reliably and uh, to be able to repeat the standard and quality of the output that you get from it, I think that's really going to change the game. One of the interesting things about Copilot tuning is that you can do this in ChatGPT today, as I understand, but it's not simple. It's not easy to tune a large language model in ChatGPT to get it to give the exact output that's really going to be useful for your organization and your use case. And from what I've seen with Copilot tuning, really Microsoft is taking that ability from ChatGPT and making it easy and accessible to actually do. And that is big. That is huge even. So for my personal use cases, yet yeah, once that tuning ability comes in, once I can really get it to give me the output that I need for it to be useful and just worth my time, I think that could change everything. But we have to wait and see. So if you're looking at deploying Copilot today, I think that it's not worth just rolling it out to all of your users. I think you should pick a small pilot group that you work with and you get them to test the various features within Copilot to see if it's useful to them because it's not going to be suitable for all users. And I think that it's a little bit soon to say this is a failure. So there's some interesting information from another survey this week that was carried out by Price Waterhouse Cooper. And this is about the effect of AI on the job market. So they studied job postings, I think, over the last two years. And they noted that in industries where AI is having a big impact, like software engineering, that wages have increased quite a lot and so has productivity. But what they noticed in industries that AI is having less impact is that number of job postings grew much faster at a faster rate than those in industries where AI has a big impact. So what this means is, you know, you know, sectors like the software engineering sector is not growing at the rate as sectors that are less affected by AI. And of course, that's a problem if you're a software engineer looking for a job. You could even say today that those sectors that are affected by AI, especially the software engineering sector, is actually decreasing because we know that the big tech companies in the States have laid off a lot of people. Again, we heard this week that Microsoft was laying off a whole load of people in Washington and that it was going to largely affect software engineers. So that's a big problem. So if you have AI skills, the potential to earn more is there, according to this study. So is it worth learning how to use AI if you're a software engineer? Absolutely. Because you know, there's a risk with this kind of thing. Of course, AI could essentially replace you at some point in the future. But the people who do stay on, the people who do remain employed are going to need AI skills and they're going to need to know how to work with this technology. So it's a bit of a double edged sword. Now, there's been a lot of stuff coming out of, you know, the, the tech bros in the States, if you like, about how AI is going to create new job opportunities and that we shouldn't really be worried about it at the same time as big companies, big companies like Microsoft are actually laying off huge amounts of people. So it's very well to say you shouldn't be worried when clearly people are losing their jobs and you know, Microsoft isn't saying directly that they're losing their jobs because of artificial intelligence, but then at the same time, they're saying up to 30% of all of their code is now generated by AI. So, of course, people draw their own conclusions about this. 
What I think is, and it's not something that, of course, anybody can guarantee, is that we're going to go through a period of turmoil and difficulty. Because it's not that new jobs might not be created, it's a question of when they're going to be created. This initial stage, we're going to see a lot of layoffs, especially you know, people who are in the software uh, industry, I think, is going to be especially affected. But by no means, not, not only the software industry. And I think there's going to be a period of possibly many years as organizations adjust to this transformation to potentially create new jobs, you know, based on the fact that there's lots of mundane things that software engineers and other employees no longer have to do. Now, I could be completely wrong about that but we have kind of seen that over history as you know industries have collapsed and you know people eventually get re retrained and re-employed in other sectors but it doesn't happen overnight those new jobs those new opportunities don't happen overnight will we have this utopia where ai essentially is doing i don't know 60 percent 70% of all of the work for us and leave you know a large percentage of the population unemployed it's a possibility of course i can't predict the future but i would hope that we're going to see some new positions created and organizations starting to give people more meaningful work a company in the uk called node 4 has recently carried out a survey and they're saying that 97 percent of all mid-market organizations are looking to repatriate cloud workloads or certain cloud workloads now, this has been a discussion that's been happening for a couple of years now about the repatriation of cloud workloads to private data centers, all the rest of it. But what exactly is happening here? Well, organizations are looking at particular workloads that don't necessarily benefit from the scalability that the cloud can give. So you imagine you have a web server that one day only services 10 requests and the next day it needs to service 20,000 requests. The cloud is great at being able to give that particular workload access to a whole load of compute resources on demand so that you as an organization don't have to rent them permanently. Now, that kind of workload, of course, is very suitable for the public cloud, but why would you move other workloads back to your own data center? Well, there are various reasons that are being cited, including performance, compliance, and data sovereignty. And I think that performance is probably one that we underestimate. I know that it can be quite frustrating to use applications or web apps. Sometimes they can be slow. And I know from the stuff that I read about Windows, you look at the new Windows uh, Outlook client, which is essentially a web application, and it can be clunky, it doesn't perform as well as the old mail and calendar app that was originally part of, I think, Windows 11 and Windows 10, if, if I remember correctly. So there are, of course, advantages to developing web applications. You develop it once, it can run in many places. You don't have to develop a native application. But whenever we rely on the cloud for something, it can lead to bottlenecks in performance and latency and all the rest of it. And that's before we even start talking about the potential security issues and data sovereignty, especially if you're in Europe, of course, now. So a lot of organizations are looking at a hybrid approach, looking at bringing a lot of those workloads back to their own data centers, keeping certain workloads in the cloud if they need the scalability that the cloud can offer. If you found this video useful, I'd appreciate if you gave it a thumbs up because it helps to get the video seen by more people on YouTube and to grow the channel. I'm going to leave you with another video now about a new tool in Windows for backing up user settings. So do check that out. But that's it from me for this week and I'll see you next time.